Good afternoon, everybody. It's five o'clock, and I would like to call this meeting to order. If I may, um, at this point in time, ask for a motion to allow Dr. Kraft to um, attend our meeting virtually. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. And now if we, uh, if everybody will please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Thank you. And um, if you will now join us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Thank you. Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Yes, Madam Chair. Mr. Bryant? Present. Ms. Bryson Morseberger? Ms. Dooley? Here. Dr. Kraft? Present. Ms. McKeever? Here. Mr. Morse? Present. And Ms. Torres? Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right, now I will call for approval of our proposed agenda. And second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Great, thank you. Um, now uh, we will open this up for comments from members of the community. Anybody here in the media center is welcome to come to the podium. And if there's anybody in signed up or watching us through Zoom, um, I would ask that you please state your name, address, and you have three minutes for comment. And I'm not sure if anybody's in, in the Zoom room currently. We'll give it just another minute. Um, this would also be an opportunity. We'll just kind of roll it all into one, if I may, for uh, public comment regarding the budget or anything else. Pardon me? Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, yeah, not maybe not now, but yes, coming up. Okay, so no public comment in general, but now if there's anybody who would like to speak specific to our budget, Again, this would be our 2022-2023 budget. This would be an opportunity to provide public comment. All right, thank you. Um, please keep in mind, if you have questions or comments, you can always email us as well. And we will move right along to um, an action item. Dr. Odie. Madam Chair, uh, members of the board. Last um, board meeting, Pat Cuomo, Director of Technology, presented information on the proposed private fiber network project for board information. That was on February 3rd. Uh, the item is now being presented for approval. I move the approval of the private fiber network project. I second. Are there any questions, board members? Um, I quickly, I did have a couple of questions in that last, if Ms. Powell, if you mind uh, coming up to the podium, please. And she may provide some other information, but I had specifically asked if it was possible to, to push into some of our um, other neighborhoods. 
beyond yeah. what what we would be doing with our network. Yes. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Odie. Uh, Pat Cuomo provided some, has prepared some additional information for you all in response to the questions that were asked at the previous meeting. So the first question was, is there the possibility of improving home accessibility for our community? And the answer is absolutely yes. It is possible to expand or build this type of network into our neighborhoods where internet access might be needed for students and families. Um, additional comments from one of the vendors who are, would be likely proposing on this procurement is that uh, they are using a similar strategy in Phoenix where they used E-rate and, the and the school district to lay the backbone for the network. Now they are building out to the city, county, and homes within the area. Of course, these additional sites are on separate strands of fiber in order to keep the district on their own private network as possible. So there can't, there wouldn't be a co-mingling, but it's about putting the backbone in place and then it would largely be up to the city to take advantage of the opportunity from there. Um, they, this, in the case of this particular project in Phoenix, just as an example, they're beginning to have more conversations of this nature in anticipation of new infrastructure bills that were passed recently. So this is what this particular vendor is seeing beyond that project, because with the new infrastructure re bill recently passed to fund broadband throughout the nation, there are gonna be great opportunities coming down the pipeline for federal dollars to be utilized. And that would be something that would be, you know, those will be opportunities for the city to consider. So um, from another vendor, as an example, um, taking West Haven as just an example, um, that serves hundred, that has 126 public housing units the project scale to bring fiber to that many units would be um, in around 0.53 miles total, considering the, um, so considering the number of units and the 0.53, roughly half a mile total area, the cost for something like that would be in the range of 93,000 to $118,000. So that's an example. If you take just West Haven as an example, and that's just an estimate, um, but that would be an example of what it would be like to work off of the, dis the school district's backbone if the city wanted to bring service into that particular area. Um, this isn't on here, but I would just say, you know, all of this is based on today's dollars and who knows where things will go from there. But um, this does not include the actual internet service, of course, this just gets the service into that locality. Um, the act for the actual internet service beyond the construction, that's a separate cost. Um, so the analogy, building off of an analogy that um, I think Pat used in the previous presentation, we're building a race that, that puts the racetrack in place. There's still the vehicles that would need to be purchased. In other words, once you get that infrastructure built into that neighborhood or any neighborhood. Um, again, this other vendor highlighted, there are currently billions of grant dollars available to bring high-speed connectivity to cities and counties and underserved locations and underserved locations will take first priority for those dollars. So uh, definitely appreciate Mr. Cuomo, you know, doing that follow-up just to provide some context for what could be possible. And I think he did a really good job with those additional details and using uh, a particular community as not just an example, if you will. Thank you. Um, I also might wanna add just before you take your, your vote, you're not only authorizing the procurement to move forward with the um, private fiber network, but just as a reminder, this would be authorizing use of uh, up to or approximately $280,000 from our federal relief funds. So I just want that to be uh, very transparent for you all and for the public that it's authorizing the procurement for this construction project to go forward and also um, saying that you are okay with using, uh, making that a use of our federal relief dollars. Thank you. All right, any other questions, comments? We've got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great, thank you. Kind of exciting. All right, and we are next moving to um, our budget documents and, and presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Again, we have Ms. Kim Powell, our Chief Operations Officer, and she's gonna present the FY23 budget presentation for board discussion. Ms. Powell. Thank you, Dr. Odie. So uh, we won't, I keep looking up there like there's slides that are gonna appear. <laughs> I'm gonna wait for a moment for 
Ms. Thacker to share the presentation. So there really isn't new material in this presentation. Um, things have been pretty consistent throughout our our journey together, our path forward, if you will, that we've been laying ever since the workshop, um, the work session on January 15th. Our budget priorities and our focus areas have not changed. Um, reconfiguration is still ta a top priority along with our focus on student programs and staff compensation and benefits. Um, we, we truly are a people business. And these things go hand in hand with our strategic plan for safe and supportive schools, academic excellence, and organizational supports. Oh, are you advancing or me, Rose? Okay, I think we may have. Okay, so this is the graphic that we've been using to sort of illustrate our process this year and the situation that that we, along with many other school division, divisions have with working ahead, addressing the challenges, while at the same time uh, reducing our dependency on non-recurring funds for recurring expenses. So right now our current budget has a little over 4.5, close to four, uh, $5 million in CARES money, if you will, for recurring expenditures. And so the way we have to address this moving forward or cool off this budget is we have to increase revenue from recurring sources in combination with decreasing expenditures. And the board uh, working with staff has really made great strides in, in doing this. So now we look at our budget change documents. This is the format we use every year to detail the changes in our budget. It steps the public and anyone else who wants to look at it through exactly what the proposed changes are, both with regard to increases and decreases. The first section is always um, devoted to our salary and benefit actions. This budget proposes an average increase of 5% uh, for all staff, and that is step plus in order to receive that average increase of 5%. So it, it involves getting the step plus, in the case of teachers and administrative staff, 3.75% for support staff, which are your custodians, nutrition workers, IAs, um, and certain office support staff, it's a 4% increase on top of STEP because the STEPs are only about 1% in separation as opposed to the one and a quarter on the other scales. This, uh, this action also includes addressing our health insurance increase and a small increase in our employee assistance program. Uh, next, we move into our recurring and non-discretionary contracts. We actually, um, put forth some uh, recommended uh, decreases in certain areas, and those are detailed here with the negative numbers. The biggest increases are with our city contracts for people transportation and maintenance. There is also a small increase of $15,000 to address the budget line we use to pay um, annual stormwater tax fees that are assessed to the schools from the city. Um, but you can also see where um, you know, the technology team came forward with a more cost-effective option to do the technology audits. You can see where we reviewed all of our software subscriptions, and a lot of those subscriptions go up, but we were also able to identify programs and areas where we could make reductions. Um, so the net increase was only $33,000, and um, I won't take you line by line through these items because we've been through them in many um, previous presentations. The only increases that are being put forward in this budget um, beyond the um, salary and benefit actions that are needed are a small stipend for CHS theater assistance um, to bring that in line with like the way we uh, handle assistant coaches in sports. There are people who are working with um, the theater program. And we wanted to address the, the support that those folks have been giving. And then we have speech pathologists and psychologists who are serving as leads for their area in the division, but they weren't getting the lead, they weren't getting stipend as leads. And so th that is also shown as being addressed here. I also wanna mention on the salary action, which is obviously the most significant uh, cost driver, the 5% is in line with, in, with what is currently proposed in the state budget for salary action for all um, SOQ funded positions, which means it touches every category of position, not just teachers, but also uh, guidance counselors and principals and every type of position basically that you have in the school division. So in order to get the 
funds from the state that would go towards helping with any type of salary action, uh, Renee Hoover and the finance department and I at some point have to certify that the action that we took is in line with the proposed action in the state budget in order to be eligible to receive any funding from the state towards any salary action. That's how that works. So that's where that 5% is, that's a big factor behind that 5% number. So um, the reduction section in this year's proposed budget is significant. Um, there has been a lot of work looking at um, our current vacancies and possible reorganizations. And I won't detail that here, but it's the equivalent of 17 FTEs and a proposed savings of over $850,000. Um, the other, the next three items were things that were needed during the height of the pandemic to support virtual instruction or students learning from home. We sent a lot of books home. We don't have to keep refreshing the book room. We've done one refresh. We can, we can slow that down. And then um, we did a lot with internet communications and connectivity. Uh, during the height of the pandemic with hot spots and things like that. But some of those things we could, uh, did not need to be recurring expenses. So those reductions are all reflected here. And it's close to a million dollars in proposed reductions. And the team worked really hard to bring that forward. Um, and then last but not least, flipping to the revenue side of the budget, um, based on Governor, Governor Northrum's uh, budget proposal back in December, uh, Charlottesville would be looking at an increase of 1.7, almost $1.8 million in state revenue. And that certainly helps our thermometer situation. And so when you take everything that's put together on the expense side, the proposed salary action, which is in line with the state action, our health insurance cost increase, which we didn't have any cost increase last year, this year we do, and medical inflation has not stopped. That's a huge factor in that cost alone. The contract changes all of it, you take all of that together, you take the state increase, and then what that leaves is an estimated increase for the city that's based largely on two things. It's based on the formula allocation increase, which is 40% of new personal property and real estate tax, property taxes. So the 40% number is $3,337,820 based on the latest estimate that we received from our colleagues at the city. If you take that number and you add to it just the increases for the city contracts, which are which is money that the city allocates us, to us, but then we send that money back to them to pay for these services. You take those numbers, put them together, and it results in a city request of uh, $4,216,341. So a little over 4.2 million. And again, the basis of that $4.2 million ask is the formula allocation baseline, if you will, and then just the increases in the city's contracts that they have with us. And if we do these things, if all of this pans out the way we are proposing that it should, or that we estimate it should, then we would actually be able to decrease our dependency on the non-recurring funds by over 2.4, almost $2.5 million, almost cutting that in half, taking that thermometer down by half. And by way of reminder, we only have one more budget cycle to work out this thermometer issue with non-recurring funds. So to make 50% progress in this year seems about right because that still leaves us with half the hill to climb next year. So uh, this is the same slide that you uh, saw at your last meeting when we were talking about this budget proposal. And um, this time I added some, some additional uh, flags, if you will, to highlight some things that I didn't highlight when we looked at this last time. The um, increase in the general operating fund of 3.9 million, it's 3.5 million. You can see this down there in the bottom where the star is. It, the increase is 3.5 million in the actual operating budget. And then every year, whatever our residual balance is, once the audit and everything happens from the prior year, that money goes to what we call fund balance. And so the, there's $387,251 that's actually just recognizing the adjustment in fund balance from the previous year's audit. So I didn't highlight that the last time I was at the podium talking about the budget, but I wanted to draw your attention to that at the bottom of the slide there. When you look at the special revenue funds, and I'll be honest, normally in, a normal, in normal times, in a normal budget year, the special revenues line the special revenues fund is not where the action is. It's not the most exciting part of the budget discussions. 
all of that has changed with CARES and ARPA money. And so what I really want to highlight there is 8.5, almost $8.6 million increase in special revenues funds. That's, that's big, that's huge, but that's really all around the, um, the ARPA money is the main driver of that. And so our finance director, Renee Hoover, did a great job, I thought, of really detailing what's behind that significant increase so that anyone looking at this presentation or the public can understand why that big jump. A lot of what's going on here to go from a proposed budget of 94.3 million to over 106 million, you know, crossing that threshold into a budget that's over 100 million, a lot of that's being driven by this one-time money that we have at this time that we have to reflect in our budget. So I just wanted to draw your attention to those helpful tables at the bottom that explain the changes. So as I alluded to earlier, assuming all goes as proposed, we, we cut the thermometer roughly in half in one year. And there would be more work to be done in the next budget cycle but I think this represents a great, a great effort, a solid plan to quote Dr. Gurley, a, a path forward, a reasonable path forward. Um, so the table to the right just shows, it summarizes our overall picture with where we are with the non-recurring funding. You can see that the total of the three major awards has been over 15.7 million. We used a little over 336,000 last year. The current adopted budget has that 4.5, almost 4.6 million in it from the original adopted budget. And then this current proposal is um, suggesting that we allow for over a little over 2.1 million to be used in next year's budget for FY 2023. And that would leave about 8.7 million still to be used for the FY 24 budget in operations or preferably steering that money into more non-recurring expenditures in a way that um, is most impactful for the community. So with that, a friendly reminder of where we are in this process. Um, we had the, you know, this budget work session is on the calendar in part because if there were any significant signals of changes that would need to be made based, you know, on what we were hearing from city leadership, this work session would be critical for working those things out before you all are scheduled to adopt a budget on, uh, on February 24th. It appears that we are not, you know, we're, we haven't received any indications from the city that they have issues with our budget proposal. Um, there could be some tiny technical adjustments perhaps between now and then, but nothing of any significance for us to sort out or for the board to sort out this evening. Um, then the board will be presenting the budget to council officially on March the 7th. And the um, council is scheduled to adopt um, the budget and, and the tax rate on April 12th, mid-April. So that is the last slide in the, in the deck. And I'm happy to answer questions if you have them. Thank you. Um, start with comments or questions. I don't know, Dr. Kraft, do you have any comments or questions? Um, I don't at this time. I feel very confident and solid about the work that's been done on this budget um, and very ready to move forward with this and approve it. So nothing at this time. And I appreciate all the work that's been, that's gone into this to date. Thank you. Ms. Dooley, any questions? Mr. Morris, Mr. Bryant? Ms. McKeever. I actually just wanted to emphasize the one thing that was on like one of the first slides. Uh, the health insurance increase is $818,000. Um, and I just want to make that special note <laughs> that um, that's health insurance is almost a million dollar additional cost um, over last year, which is just a crazy amount of increase that we have literally no control over. Um, well, virtually no control over. We do our best to make the to to make the benefits um, the same and and minimize the cost increases. But this is a dramatic increase, and especially when you're looking at our thermometer, <laughs> you're like, okay, this cannot increase again another million dollars next year. Um, and I just 
that's a very significant point, I think. So, um, but I also wanted to just clarify, um, can we approve this, this today? Like we're having a meeting at the end of the month. It seems very redundant. I just wanna like, I just don't, this is a, supposed to be a work session, but it's very much like a school board I, I'm meeting. And so that's why I just wanna ask that, like, are we required to have? I, I'm not uh, sure about the, the noticing. I would be concerned I, about the noticing if we take yeah. if action were taken today. I know it feels like, because this year it has been relatively smooth as far as we've conveyed information to the city and there hasn't been pushback or, or significant counters with regard to what's being proposed for operations. But, um, and if I may, just regarding the health insurance, there are very minor adjustments that we are looking at for the plan, but they're very minor tweaks. Um, we go through this every year, not a year goes by that we don't have to do some maneuvering or negotiation around, you know, tweaking the plan or um, looking at shopping out like the reinsurance or whatever, um, the stop loss insurance, things like that. We are looking at offering, um, we're putting things in the works to hopefully offer a health savings account, a HSA option for next year. So I just wanna be clear that we're not just sitting back thinking there's nothing we can do, but with something like implementing an HSA, which frankly, I think a lot of our younger employees expect and they're looking for when they come to us, we have great benefits, but um, we have a very traditional benefit offering that hasn't been changed significantly in a long time. And so we need to strike that balance between preserving the great benefits that we have, but also putting into the mix the some of the newer tools that are out there. And um, part of what we're seeing this year with a ten with a double digit increase at ten percent, it's certainly not the only year we've had a double digit increase. Sometimes you just have rough years with your experience and utilization. But um, I feel like part of it this year was you know you have two years worth of medical inflation to kick to to make up for if nothing else. And even though during COVID our utilization was down a bit the medical inflation certainly didn't stop and is at this point, I think, accelerating. So those are just some of the challenges we're dealing with and some things we don't have control over, but we are doing the best we can with some things proactively that will hopefully help next year. I don't, I'm not naive. I think there would still be an increase next year, but to your point, we've got to, we want to slow that. I don't think I've ever seen 800,000. Like I've seen 300,000, I've seen 500,000, but 800,000 yeah. is a dramatic increase. Usually we're in the range of, um, more like a six to seven, eight percent was on the high end for most years. But you always have to remember now we're, you know, as we've with more staff, different things like that factor in too. So um, it's just something we we're, we're on it to the extent that we can be. There are things we absolutely cannot control. There are things we can always try to improve. And so um, thank you for that. Then what was the other thing that you were saying? Oh, about action tonight. I, yeah, I think to your point, I think, and because we want to notice it and give, um, if there's an opportunity or, or uh, for city staff, uh, the city manager to meet or, you know, have that opportunity to speak with Dr. Gurley or our staff at all, if there are any changes, um, I think we would look to, to maintain our, our current schedule. I would just like to reduce the number of school board meetings we have that I, are know, just I like just, 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I just love seeing you guys. So um, appreciate all the time and, and the work that everybody has done. Um, I don't know if anybody else has questions about um, the budget. So I appreciate you bringing that. I don't know if, if anybody wants to get a quick update on, on anything else that's going on. Um, I do just quickly, we did have a meet, an opportunity to meet and do a tour of Buford last Friday. Um, that was Dr. Gurley. Um, it included Mr. Sanders, Ms. Marshall, Ms. Thomas, uh, Councillor Payne, Councillor McGill, Mr. Jordan. Um, we had Mr. Knox from VMDO and Mike Goddard from the city. So it was a great opportunity to walk through Buford, um, allowing them a couple of the councilors and even um, Ms. Marshall and Mr. Sanders, the opportunity to see that campus for the first time. Some things that, that I think I took away with um, the impact and Ms. Marshall was astounded at the open campus, at the, the lack of safety um, there. She's, um, and also the ADA inaccessibility mm -hmm. and challenges there. Um, as a parent who had a child that went through Buford, um, I definitely saw it 
through different eyes this time walking and really looking at that building. I haven't been in there for a while to look at it like that. Um, the inequity um, as far as some of the classroom sizes, um, the indoor classes um, that are used by some of our smaller groups, our ESL groups, um, the kids who need, you know, with, with special education uh, interventions are in teeny tiny little rooms, no natural light. Um, and it just astounded me as a parent and now as a school board member that at the time I was just struggling to, to make sure that my daughter got what she needed, but I know she was in those little classes <laughs> and I didn't even think about it like that. But it was, a, like I said, it was a great opportunity for the counselors to, to be able to ask some questions, um, some of the questions that, that came up towards the end um, that I think are worthwhile um, publicly bringing up and sharing with you all was questions about um, the difference between just renovating Buford versus reconfiguring it. And, and, you know, why can't we do something like that as opposed to the whole reconfiguration? And so I think it was worthwhile for them to hear um, that during part of the public process, the community design groups um, in the beginning, that was one of the options that VMDO laid out and what that would entail if we were to just update the current building to renovate it, it would require moving kids off campus. It would, it would require um, portable or mobile uh, spaces and it would require over a million dollars is what I believe uh, Mr. Knox said just for the buildings to house and to, to educate the students and potentially having them off site for a couple of years while, while the renovation was going on. So that alone, that was, an op or that was one option that was presented, like I said, really early on in the, in the community design and public engagement part of this throughout the summer. And right, off the, right out of the gates, that was something that the public said, we don't want that. We don't want that for our students. And, and again, I think it's important for the public to hear that um, the $75 million that is being proposed for renovation is, is not pie in the sky. It's not everything we wanted. And actually everything we wanted and when it was priced out was over, I don't even remember, a hundred and some million dollars. And so we really have come down and made cuts and, and you know sacrifices in some ways to get to, to the $75 million. So it was a great opportunity. And I just wanted to um, express my gratitude to uh, Principal Jordan for his time and, and leading that tour. And I, I believe we have another tour scheduled with Mayor Snook, um, so in a week or two. Also some other questions that I think that have come up and I think are uh, warrant. Um, there was a lot of talk and has been a lot of talk about looking at, um, you know, how is re reconfiguration going to impact learning? Um, third grade reading scores. I mean, we were all part of that meeting, you know, and I just want to, for the, the public's sake, I want to um, make sure that they know that we have prioritized through our budget um, this, you know, lots of things that are going to make an impact on our youngest learners, um, prioritizing our social emotional learning and the mental health and the positions um, within the buildings to do that. As far as the um, literacy, um, we have trained, I believe, 40 of our educators last year, and I think there's a cohort of about 45 currently this year in letters, in, um, and that's a type of literacy instruction and training. So we are um, investing in, in people who are going to be actually working with our kids to make a difference for those. Another question that often comes up is the per pupil expenditure and how Charlottesville um, rate so high with that. And actually I'll let Ms. Powell speak to that as she has some uh, firsthand knowledge. And <laughs> Spoken to that one more than a few times. Um, it's actually pretty straightforward. There are two primary reasons that Charlottesville's per pupil expenditure um, is, is in the you know higher part of the state, I believe. I, I pulled the 2019-2020, um, the which is the most recent year where their comparison is available because we have to wait for this report to come out from the state in order to compare ourselves with other localities. So um, we were seventh uh, for 1920. And the two primary reasons are, first and foremost, operating six small neighborhood-based elementary schools that have 
around 300 students or less. I mean, that's, a commun that's something that the community values. I don't think there's any desire to change that. And honestly, as affordable housing moves forward and our student population increases, there's a high probability that those, at least three of those schools would not, we would have to expand on those schools and they would become more typically sized. But at this point, they are with their small community neighborhood-based elementary schools. And I think the community really appreciates that. Um, hand in hand with that, but it goes beyond the elementary schools, are just simple economies of scale. Um, and that kind of coupled with our depth and breadth of programming. Basically, the smaller the school division, the fewer pupils you have to spread the costs over or to allocate costs to. And all, yet all school divisions in the Commonwealth have to provide the same basic and essential services and functions for all the students. Um, and this impact of economies of scale is really evident when you look at the PPE for school districts like Surrey, Highland, and Bath, which are in the top five in the state. And yet, and I know I'm sure they're fine school districts, but when you would look at them programmatically, you would not necessarily think that they're, they're not offering the depth and breadth of programming we are, and yet they're in the top five. And so that speaks really clearly and loudly to the impact of economies of scale on PPE or per pupil expenditure as a metric. Um, other factors that, well, for us, you take that economies of scale factor and you add into that, that we're a mid-sized school district offering a depth and breadth of programming that's on par with much larger school districts. Most school districts our size don't have an orchestra program or some of the other, the, the depth of our fine arts program, especially extending into their middle school and even our upper middle school uh, or Walker rather upper elementary. You don't find that in school districts our size or even larger. Um, we have the AVID program, which is a program that's not offered by many school divisions. You have STEM and then you have preschool, which Charlottesville has been invested in, you know, at a much, uh, with the three-year-old program, you know, much bigger investment, much longer than anyone else. I, I can't say at this moment, you know, where other school districts stand with, with pre-K, but I know that the Charlottesville investment in three-year-olds has been not typical. So um, you, you take all of those, that depth and breadth of programming type things, and you couple that with the fact that we're a mid-size or what they call small to mid-size school division. Again, that's fewer students to spread those costs over. Um, secondary to the six neighborhood elementary schools and the economies of scale factor, there are two other things really, the cost to compete, which that can be a regional thing. You certainly see that at play in Northern Virginia, but our closest competitor that's literally all around us, Albemarle County, is also in the top 20 for PPE per pupil expense in the state. So there's that factor. And Albemarle has over three times as many students to spread all their costs over. So you take a position like the finance director, Ms. Hoover, or our special ed coordinator, or Leslie Thacker in the division administration office, any of those expenses, they've got over three times more people to spread that cost over. That's huge. Uh, yet we need to be com competitive in our offerings with that, you know, as a, as a close, com you know, in this area, they're all, literally all around us. And when it comes to competing for staff and so forth, close to home, I mean, we have no choice but to be competitive or our, or our buildings won't be staffed. And then last but not least, um, student needs and eligibility for grant funds can also be a factor. So you take a locality like Charlottesville, where we've consistently ranked among the top um, as far as diversity with the number of languages we're serving. You look at things like the percentage of disadvantaged students, all of those needs come with additional programming needs and costs associated with that. Um, on the good side, that does make us eligible for um, more grant funding from state and federal sources. So, but again, that, that's more money in the pot that increases your per pupil expense. Um, and frankly, we could use more <laughs> to deal from the, from the state and the federal government to address you know, the special populations. Um, and then also, gratefully, we have um, members of our community who recognize these needs and there's local grants and local funding that comes to bear that's not from the city, but that money also ends up in our budget and therefore ends up in our per pupil expense calculation. So there are a lot of pieces and parts that result in us being you know, in the top 10 for per pupil expense. Um, and those things just have to be considered, but the, the economies of scale piece cannot be overstated because again, look at who's in the top five. You've got your, you know, Arlington's and Loudons and so forth, but you've got Bath, Surrey, and Highland County, and no one would say that they're, you know, it's really can become kind of apples and oranges. No one would say that they're inefficient, 
because their, um, their per pupil costs are high. I would argue that those folks are probably wearing a ton of different hats trying to make it work, but they're not serving as many people. And so they have fewer pupils to spread the cost. Thank you. Appreciate that. You need to archive that. I was gonna say, I don't know that they're listening, the right people. <laughs> I don't know. It's good for all of us to hear, good for me to hear it again. So I appreciate that. Don't all right. You, did you mention the neighborhood elementary schools? I did. <laughs> that and the economies of scale. And, and thank you, Ms. McKeever, because you've done a great job of bringing that out whenever this topic comes up. And it's true, it's, it's a consideration, but yet I think there, the community would be up in arms if we ever look to move away from that model. But it's a, you know, that's, that would be a community decision. Yeah. Thank you. I would say, please don't ever give away or sell any school properties because we, we, need, we need all the land. I can guarantee you that. Absolutely. All right. Anything else? Any other questions, board members? Dr. Kraft, behind me, any questions? Or in front of me? <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. All right. Moving on, just to announce to everybody that we um, will see your lovely faces again next Thursday, February 24th, 5 p.m. here, where we will uh, meet to approve the superintendent's proposed budget. Um, we then will have our regularly scheduled Charlottesville City School Board meeting on Thursday, March 3rd. And if there are no questions or further comments, I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thank you.